We are in 1 Timothy chapter 3 uh, this morning. And uh, if you recall, this is uh, Paul's instruction to Timothy. Um, And Timothy is at Ephesus, ministering at Ephesus. And people say, well, where's Paul? Well, this is the notorious, maybe, who knows, possibly a fourth missionary journey. We don't really know for sure because um, we don't have a record of it. When Luke wrote uh, the book of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, he uh, makes, it's a kind of a literature, a piece of literature that begins with um, Christ uh, coming to earth, the Luke, the story of the birth of Jesus, and ends with um, the message of Jesus going out to the world. So it's kind of a, a literary piece that Luke does. Luke and Acts go definitely together. And it ends right there when Paul is in Rome. And, the, and the end, at the end of uh, Acts, if you recall, he talks about how Paul in Rome has reached all of that Roman, all the Roman world there now. That's kind of come full circle. So it's kind of interesting how uh, now Paul is somewhere. It appears that he's continuing on doing missionary journeys. And he sent Timothy to Ephesus. And Timothy is a pretty... Um, qualified young man and that I think that's why Timothy the book of Timothy has always been of such an interest to me because Timothy is not um, Timothy is not a low skilled person hey come on in in fact Timothy is very well respected by Paul and had been through with him through some very difficult times and has been a Christian for a while and followed Paul from that second missionary journey on so as a young man, he has had a lot of direct instruction. And I always felt like as a kid growing up in the church that I knew a lot about the church, but I had questions about things, how things should go. And so I felt like, well, Timothy's like the perfect, I felt like I could understand what was being said to Timothy from Paul. So we are in chapter three. In chapter one, um, we re- if you remember 1 Timothy 1, Paul warns, Uh, Timothy about the problem of people being false teachers of the law. There's a bunch bunch of different uh, ideas going around, and he warns Timothy about being careful and helping to get things back on track. In chapter 2, it begins with um, Paul's help to Timothy about their instructions for worship. They were having a few problems in their worship service, and so Paul was giving Timothy some instruction about how to take care of those different problems that were going on in a way that would be um, appropriate. So if you look at uh, verse um, uh-huh, chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in, in chapter 2, he talks in verse... Um, one, he talks about praying, talks about how in verse 3, that it pleases God who wants all men to be saved. In other words, even those people that you don't like very much, even those leaders that you might be frustrated with, and we could name a few, right, at this time in the politics. You could name I a like few. Them. You like I, them? I like them. That's just because you like entertainment. But <laughs> yeah, so he's saying you got to pray for everyone, even those guys, is what he's saying there. And because, and he says in verse um, 4, who wants all people to be saved and to come a knowledge of truth. Now, we know Paul is like that, right? One thing that we've seen in the writings that we've seen from Paul is this real emphasis on grace and on faith and coming to a knowledge of Christ, right? There's a real focus on that, that that's the primary point. In fact, he's willing to do most anything to keep that point up front. Even Timothy knows that very well. Why does Timothy know that Paul's, Paul will do almost anything to not make a controversy other than Christ? He didn't travel around. Yeah, well, what did Paul do once Timothy decided he wanted to go with them? Didn't he have him continue to be circumcised? Aha! Uh-huh. <laughs> There's no minor thing, Right? Paul actually circumcised Timothy because Timothy's mom was Jewish and father was Greek and Paul wanted to take him on the missionary journey but he asked that if he would be circumcised. Now why would Paul do that? He's going around preaching that you're saved by faith, you know, by grace through faith 
Why did he have Timothy circumcised? He says himself, you, we read it several times, you can go back and read it yourself, because he's going around and ministering. He wants to keep the focus on Christ and on what Christ has to offer people, not on anything else. The first place he goes in every town is the synagogue. And he uses his credentials to get in there because people know Paul, that he's you know, uh, very highly rated among Jewish speakers, right? So he gets in there and then he preaches the gospel to them. He starts from the Old Testament and preaches Christ to them. Now they accept everything he says except for one minor detail. What's the thing they always get mad at? Jesus. And what about Jesus? They're willing to accept Jesus Christ. They never have tried to stone him because he said Jesus was the Christ. That we're not under the law anymore. The, uh, the whole law thing. Now that's like over the top, right? For that time in the world, if you started saying you were not bound by the law, that was when they pick up the rocks. They didn't like when he said that they killed him. <laughs> they didn't they, like they when didn't he said like he killed him. They didn't like that at all. <laughs> You know, that wasn't so much it, though. Most when of them... Feel, when he said he's God and they, they killed him, they didn't like that. But you know what's funny is that's from our perspective. But really, the thing that... And if you look at the passages where they started to stone him, it almost always says it's that when he began to say that the law was no longer there. So it's almost like they even would accept the blame for killing him, but don't be picking on the law. Don't be saying anything about the law which is important in this passage because what we see in Paul's instruction to Timothy is people setting things up the way they've always been, kind of Jewish-like. So they're setting up the Christian church and it's looking kind of Jewish. Now we don't do that these days, right? I gotta get a clean Do we do that this, these days? Look at the shape of our sanctuary. What does the shape of our sanctuary remind you of? Reminds me of every Catholic church I've ever seen in the world. <laughs> Whoever decided that a church needs to be long and narrow with a tall ceiling? We don't even think about it. It's just a natural part of thinking that's what a church might look like, right? It's like mm -hmm. no, nobody said, well, let's make ours look kind of like a Catholic church. But I know uh, when David was Catholic and he was invited to church, it was not Avenue Christian Church. And that not Avenue Christian Church had the same kind of format. And I've often thought that if someone were Catholic and they were going to be involved in a Christian church, it would be easier in one that had a setup like that. When I was in Glendale, we were part of the construction of a church, and the sanctuary was square, kind of squarish, and it had rounded pews, kind of curved like this. It didn't look Catholic at all. And I always thought, I wonder if it's easier for someone, if they're used to a certain tradition, to come to a church that's kind of shaped or designed in a tradition that they have become familiar with. Now, maybe you grew up in the Baptist church, and the Baptist churches you went to were shaped like this. Sarah? Or it could be the opposite. You grew up and have negative feelings. Could be the opposite. Church, so you go into that one with the curved pews or chairs or mm -hmm. whatever. It's more casual. You feel more comfortable. It's different. Just different enough, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's all about style, isn't it? That's not the important thing. It's not important what the shape is, but we can think about being more recept uh, um, presentable or more attractive to people because sometimes that's the first, the initial thing. But no matter what you do, there's gonna be something that somebody's not gonna like. Thank God there are so many flavors, right? Because mm -hmm. it's kind of yeah. good that there's different yeah. styles because mm -hmm. then those styles can fit the different people. Uh, in this community, we have at least, I think we have three churches that I could be comfortable in. When we first came here, the church was uh, doing that thing where you couldn't be a member unless you were baptized in a Baptist church and you had that letter from a Baptist church. Well, we were baptized in a non-denominational Christian church. And so I, I was kind of thinking, ooh, this, this could be a problem because I don't really want to get baptized again because I don't want to send the message to my kids that it doesn't count unless you have it done in that particular church. That was kind of a problem for me. But it wouldn't prevent me from worshiping with this body, that difference of opinion. Mm -hmm. And there were two other uh, fellowships here in Welton that we could have worshiped with, but we had certain little things that were different. And so we chose one that was closer to our style. And within a year, that rule changed and we were then good to go. There's no other big thing for us. 
So you kind of you kind of look for something that's going to fit you and fit your family and that you can work and serve in. And that's why we're brothers and sisters in Christ, even in other fellowships or other churches. Now, what one person considers orderly might be different than what another person considers orderly. And we can see in this instruction that Paul is giving to Timothy that he's trying to help him to see the kinds of things he needs to do. So what do we know about Ephesus? We know that it's the, the home place of the Temple of Diana, or they call it the Temple of the Aphrodite worship of Aphrodite worship. So it was like the worship of sex and love. And so they had a lot of promiscuity. And we know that women in that church were the priests, and the, they were the ones who ran the church. And so they were very powerful in that worship, and that was a part of that style, and that, that was going on there. And that's different than the patriarchal style of the Jewish culture, right? So here you have people who maybe were non-Jews, Greeks, who are maybe involved in this Temple of Aphrodite coming to worship. And then you have your Jews who've been converted and are now coming to the church following Christ, and they're just having a heck of a time together. <laughs> a lot of things are getting mixed up and confused there, right? So Paul is trying to help Timothy to get things kind of squared away. So he talks about, we talked about last week, we went in depth, not last week, week before, about chapter 2, where Paul is giving them instructions for worship, to make the worship more orderly and done decently and in proper order. Now I want you to know that my, when we talked about that, we talked a lot, I gave you, in fact there's still some on the seat back there, I gave you a list of the passages where, it gives, where Paul is giving people instructions on worship. Now, Paul was the one who went to all these different Greek places that the other Jews didn't go to at first. He was the first one to really do that, go out. So he was having to kind of help with all kinds of wild things that were going on at the time, right? So if I went, let's say that Vern visited a church and they were saying they were struggling and they would like Vern to come and take a look at their worship and make some suggestions of how they might be able to improve what's happening in the worship. And Vern goes in and it's a pretty good service. The sermon seems pretty good. But all of a sudden, at the end of the service, they bring out a box, and they start getting a little uh, frantic in their speaking in tongues kind of stuff. And they reach in the box, and they pull out a snake. Ooh. And they start handling snakes. And everyone starts talking about how if you really have true faith, you can handle these snakes just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, if you can handle the snake, then you can be... Now, would Vern maybe make some suggestions about that? Uh, is it a wild snake? Yeah, sure. uh, Probably. He, <laughs> he might say, you know, I know you're thinking of that one, but that verse doesn't really apply to this kind of thing. And this is kind of a dangerous practice, right? He might talk some wise counsel into that fellowship and say, you know, you asked me for my opinion. I've got to tell you, this seems a little off. It seems like you're getting distracted from the worship, right? He could do that. That's exactly what Paul is doing here for Timothy. He's saying, now, Timothy, they've got these wild ideals, these things going on. You've got to tell them, not, let's not get distracted by these things. Let's get back to the gospel of Christ. And you're having some trouble with um, people not praying for, only praying for the people you like in politics. No, we pray for all men to be saved. And you have trouble with people with um, men. It says here in verse um, 8, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. So that means whenever men pray, they must raise their hands. Mm. No. The, the style at that time was for the Jewish male when they were praying to God to put their hands up like a supplication. The real focus is on the other part of the sentence, without anger or disputing. <laughs> because we know that there was a already a reputation that they would be arguing with each other, right? Yelling, ah, rah, 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 that's what this, you know. That's so, why the Romans didn't like them. That's why the Romans didn't yeah. like them. So Paul says, don't be arguing and disputing so much. Raise your hands in prayer, uh, praise and prayer to God, supplication to God without anger or disputing. And number nine, women, dress modestly with decency and propriety. Guess what was happening? They just came out of their Temple of Diana, and they were all good to go, right? They were all dressed to the nines. So the focus was not on 
the worship. It was being on these other practices. So Paul says, let them put a, don't come with gold and pearls and expensive clothes. Be, be known for your good deeds, appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Now this part, a woman should learn quietness and full submission. Well, if you were the person who was running the temple of Diana and you get, you get uh, converted to this Christianity, you might be a little bit outspoken, maybe a little overly outspoken for the, the patriotic culture, right? So Paul's telling them, look, you guys need to be quiet, listen, be submissive, pay attention to your children, Remember that you, you're going to be saved. Not It doesn't mean like, I mean, really. Do you really think Paul is saying that in order to get saved, they have to bear children? He's just saying that your salvation, you know how you talk about you work out your salvation? What will you be doing? What are you going to do? Sarah's going to be teaching. She's teaching. So you could say, Sarah, work out your salvation in your teaching. What would that mean? She's going to be saved by teaching? No. No, it means that she's going to be teaching and witnessing for Christ and doing what she can do through that tool. Vern's retired. Vern, in your retirement, you'll be saved through your retirement. You'll, you'll be able to minister and witness to people and be a good Christian man in retirement. Right? Whatever it is, that's what, he, what, that's what he's saying here. And this thing where it says, um, if they continue with faith, love, in holiness with propriety. That's the focus. And last week when I gave you the, all the list of all the different scriptures that seem to have conflicting things, on the right side was a list of all the scriptures that are contained in here that say why. Because Paul himself says why. You don't have to look for anybody else for why he's saying that. You don't have to say, oh, that's a cultural thing. If it's a cultural thing, Paul will say it's a cultural thing. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 14. Chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 14. Although I hope to come and see you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth, Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. So why is Paul telling Timothy all this stuff? Because he thinks he's going to be delayed, and he wants to make sure that Timothy understands how to do something that's, uh, that people ought to conduct themselves in a way that's respectful and that's going to accomplish the goal of winning people to Christ. He's giving him instruction for that. If you look on that paper that I gave you, on the left side are all the kind of scriptures people take out in little pieces. And on the right are the phrases where Paul says why he's giving the instruction. So if we start now at the beginning of chapter 3. So in the beginning of chapter 3, Paul has explained how to get the church organized, that these people are having trouble with all these wild teachings. And then he talks about how to make the service itself have an orderly worship. And now in chapter 3, he's talking about the leadership. Everywhere that Paul went, he established leadership. So in this case, there's some problem with the leadership. Let's see what the problem is. Here's a trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, stop. The word overseer, not diakonos. We talked about deacon or diakonos. Mm -hmm. Diakonos is the word that means a servant. It means the person who serves waits tables is what it actually means. And Paul is going to use the word diakonos later on. This word that he uses is episkopos, which in the Greek culture was a word used for a presiding official in a civic or religious organization. So a kind of an equivalent term for us might be bishop or elder. Uh, even in real common, commonly, we might call someone the leader of an organization. It's someone who's kind of managing the organization. They're kind of keeping things uh, going. Uh, later on, uh, John, uh, the Apostle John, later on, is the bishop or the elder of the Ephesus church. Yes? So what's the difference between the elder and the deacon? Well, we're going to find out. Oh, because okay. Paul gives instructions on who a, a bishop or an elder should be, what they should be like. 
and then it gives instructions on what the deacon or diaconos should be like. But the thing we want to make sure we understand is he's trying to help them understand how the church should be organized. So if you want to look for other places where the term uh, bishop or elder are used, uh, it's used in Acts 20, verses 17 and verse 28. And those is a place where he says, make sure you establish an elder or a bishop there, a deacon, a, not deacon, but an elder there. Um, in Titus 1, uh, verses 5 to 7, talks about elders. That's the same word, episkopos. And in 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2, that's also that same word, episkopos. So it's in other places too. It's not just here. Did you get those? Mm -hmm. Acts 20, 17 and 28. Titus 1, 5 to 7. And 1 Peter 5, 1 to 2. Now, the thing that I want to point out here is right here in verse 1. Here's a trustworthy saying, If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. So before we go any further, in the Jewish culture that many of them had come from, who was the elder? The patriarch, the old guy, hence the term elder. <laughs> the, so could you aspire to it? You just had to get old. You had to be a man because it was a patriarchal society. And you had to be born into the right family. Mm -hmm. Now, there, you could say that someone was an elder in terms of they were the patriarch of the family, the older male of the family. That would be how you would get there. So can you aspire to that? Well, you can try to get as old as you can. <laughs> but you may or may not be qualified to be the leader of that. But if you were the old man of the family, you were it. Now, in the Jewish culture, though, who became the priest? Oh, only the Levites. Ooh, born a Levite. If you were born into the tribe of Benjamin... Were you allowed to be the priest? No. Every one of the families had their own like assignments, right? And you had to be born into the tribe of Levi, the Levites, in order to be a priest. So that's why that first verse, we don't even notice it, right? We don't even notice that. But in this first verse, this is an important thing for Timothy when he's dealing with these people coming from this patriarchal Jewish culture. Now, is it going to help him with the Greeks out of the temple of Diana? Not so much the, the set chapter 2 <laughs> was more about what you'd be dealing with there. But this has to do with those Jewish guys who think because they are the old patriarch, they should be in charge. And what Paul is saying is not necessarily. Because some of those old guys are taking them off onto these wild goose changes that we read about in chapter 1. Where they're doing endless genealogies and uh, these fake... Uh, uh, fake uh, uh, issues, you know, getting people distracted from actually from Christ. So we go back to chapter 3. Here's a trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach. The husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled. Now just a minute. Why is he saying this? Why is he giving this instruction on who the elder should be because he knows he might be delayed and he wants Timothy to know how to set people up for the service that they're having, for the worship they're having. So he's trying to get them set up. So let's back up then. So he's telling them what a bishop should be like. Mm -hmm. Okay, should Brianna be above reproach? What? She's not a male and she's young. She's the youngest one in this class. Would you say if you were talking with Brianna, say, Brianna, you know, aspire to make yourself above reproach. She can. That would be kind of a nice thing to say to someone. You could say, Vern, try to make yourself above reproach. Mm -hmm. Who is it we should be preaching that message to? Let's look at each one. The husband of but one wife. That means if you're from the Temple Diana, you might have multiple things going on there, right? <laughs> I think so, it should be one wife at a time. One wife at a time. <laughs> temperate? Is temperate a good advice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about self-controlled? Um, 
respectable, mm -hmm. hospitable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Able to teach. Does yes. it say you have to teach? No. no. Able. It says able. Why would why would Paul think that a Christian should be able to teach? Because if you're a real Christian, you should be able to teach because you should know your Bible. Good. And you might have to make a defense, right, yeah. of your Bible. And we just had this morning the sermon on being fishers of men, mm -hmm. right? So being able to say something about God's Word and tell someone about Christ, that would be a basic thing. You have to have it before you can give it away. Exactly. Next phrase, not given to drunkenness. Mm. That could be a problem. Not violent, but gentle. Not quarrelsome. Not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey with proper respect. Are there any of these that are only for certain people? No. No. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Now that is for the elder, but what is that a description of? Isn't that a description of a mature Christian? Mm -hmm. Aren't these all things, you could make this a list for yourself. And check it off one by one. Yes, I'm doing pretty good on this. Uh-oh, here's one I could work on. Here's one I could improve. We could as Christians, all of us, male, female, 18 years old, 80 years old, it doesn't matter. This could be a checklist for any one of us to improve our Christian walk. So why is he making it the thing for the elder? Well, you need that because an elder's going to have a lot of responsibility dealing with people, dealing with new Christians, non-Christians, quarrels. You have to be an example yes. for others. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to look, if you're going to think of someone to be on your leadership team or on your, your panel of your board of elders, if you have them, or your pastor of your church, which many churches consider the pastor to be the elder of the church, sometimes churches will have the pastor and one or two other people and they are the board of elders right if you're going to have that kind of governance then you need to make sure that the people in those capacities have these kinds of attributes because ultimately it's reflecting christ and if the mature christians mess up which we do and there's grace but that can turn a lot of people away from christ right and it's not none of these are that you're perfect at it it just means that that's the pattern of your life. So if, uh, if an individual is stumbling and having difficulty, it's not the best time to make them an elder, <laughs> right? right? Not that they're not forgiven and not that they shouldn't be a part of what's happening in our worship, but you need to reconsider if one of these areas is an area of concern, then it might be best to hold off on that until the person has it going, right? Totally. Don't put them in charge of, or as a leader, or as a model of, what it looks like to be working the Christian life until these things are under control. Now, now what, what Vern has taught me, told me, is that when a person is a drunk, they're always a drunk. You have to think of it as an alcohol is an issue you always have to be on guard for, right? Mm -hmm. Does that mean someone who's been sober 10 years, 15 years, cannot be an elder? No, it, it just means that you wouldn't do it maybe a week later, <laughs> maybe even a month later. You might wait, wait a while and make sure the person has kind of got things going and things are okay with it. Does it mean that the person has to be able to preach a good sermon? No, it says able to teach. So you can see why, if you had an elder, you would probably want to make sure they could talk to someone about Christ or talk to someone about the faith. They would be able to. But they may not have the gift of teaching. That might not be their interest. I've heard some preachers that aren't good at it. Yeah, I, I, I have mean, too. And they're getting paid. I have too. I have too. Okay, so 
Here's, uh, for me, when I was in college, this was the scripture that was being taught to me by a professor that first started me thinking about uh, why women aren't uh, leaders in the church. And it's because of a cast-off phrase that the pastor said, that, that was doing, the professor said. He said, these are all descriptions of a mature Christian. So am I not supposed to be mature because I'm a woman? That I shouldn't be trying to be mature? Because an elder has to be a man, they say, because it's written from the point of view of a patriarchal society, assuming a man, they say he. But there's other scriptures like, say, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So am I not, I don't have to do that, only the men have to do that? Yeah. Or do I have to, which, which are the ones that I'm supposed to do and which are the ones I'm not because I'm female? It's either or. There is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek. God does not recognize those differences in the same way that humans do. The only limitation are the human ones. Mm -hmm. So truly there are limitations for women even in our current culture. Because we are dealing with culture. There are also limitations for men. It used to be that a man that was bold and in charge was highly respected. Nowadays, I feel like men really have a hard time. Mm -hmm. We want them to be leaders and to step up, and yet every time they do, they get these little um, mean barbs thrown We're at them. We're toxically masculine. I'll exactly, exactly. So but women also have to be careful because sometimes we overstep. You know, there are some things that we're called to do. Submit to your husband, you know, you may be a leader and your husband may be talking to you and you're like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm the leader here. I choose. You're still submissive to him. You're not submissive to the pastor as your husband. But, I mean, there's things that sometimes the women think, I can do it all. And there's sometimes their pride gets in the way and they need to. So the down. problem is the pride, yep. right? In both men and women. And we, we need to be submissive to Christ and mm -hmm. under God's authority in Christ. And there's going to, this culture, we need to be like Timothy, who was willing to get circumcised, even though neither Paul nor Timothy felt that circumcision was a requirement. But he was willing to get circumcised in order to seek and save the loss that they were going out to. That's how far we need to be willing to go in order to reach people for Christ even to that level. So that that means I have to be quiet or not speak at certain things or whatever, I'm going to do that. If I could only speak to women, if our culture would only allow for me to speak to women about Christ, there's lots of women. Yep. Well, there's a lot to do. And if I were in a patriarchal society that said I have to be a stay-at-home and take care of the kids, that's when Paul says you'll be saved through taking care, take care of your kids. That's how you'll be working out your salvation. Win your kids to Christ. Win your neighbor's kids to Christ. When there's no limitation on the, the number of people that we could be ministering to. With those limitations are cultural because we're trying to win at the lost. If you look at verse 8, um, Eve, you'll see the word diakonos. Mm -hmm. So here's now, we talked about elders. Elders would be the ones that are in charge of things. Kind of leader, organizing. They would be kind of leaders. So diakonos, that word means the table waiter. In Greek, you would use it to talk about waiting tables. So it's more about the hands-on um, facilities things, it's taking care of things. So let's see what the difference is for, say, a deacon. Verse 8, deacons, what's the next word? Likewise. Likewise. So in other words, deacons are not that dissimilar from elders because if you have someone in the church who's in charge of putting out the tables, you surely don't want them out there cursing at everybody. Get that table over here, right? <laughs> it's someone doing a work of service, but you still want them to be godly people. So likewise, are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. That seems pretty basic right there, don't you think? Mm -hmm. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith, with a clear conscience they must first be tested and then if there is nothing against them let them serve as deacons so should you let just anybody willy-nilly come and help out 
if you're going to name that someone is a deacon of your church, that's like saying they represent your church body. Now, our church body is not perfect, but still there's a little measure of making sure they are people that are going to be good representatives of Christ, right? And making sure they're not going to try to commit some dishonest kind of thing in your fellowship. E? So if we all, <clears throat> elders and deacons, both need to have the qualities that were listed in those verses, but deacons more so. I don't think more so, because then the, the list is a little less strenuous that they do put for deacons, like worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. It seems like to me, and I, I know we're reading the same verses here, to me it seems like the elder or the bishop description is a little more rigorous, and the deacon's um, description is these things are true, but basically make sure this at least, you know, like that. So I would think that there's a little less criteria on the deacon than the elder. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. But then he said be tested first. Now the tested, we think of like somebody takes a test, can they answer all the questions right? But all he's saying is check them out. Don't just don't just put someone into a position without someone, checking them out first. Someone has a history, like a good reputation and a good history. Mm -hmm. They can be trusted. Do they walk the walk? And make sure they're not um, some bamboozler who's coming into your fellowship and gonna start um, doing some sort of money raising event with different membership or take people away from the faith. You, know, you make sure they're credible people. So there's a little less of a criteria because the elders, some of those things are like over time you know, uh, bigger, what do you call it, like more uh, mature kinds of things. Levon? Uh, it doesn't say in the deacon's uh, list that they should be able to teach. Yeah. It doesn't, and it, it says a general term. It says deacons likewise are to yeah. be men worthy of respect. So it's kind of a similar, those kind of, here's the thing. The problem is these all apply to all of us. <laughs> so we're trying to make it up like, oh, the elders this, the deacons that. But we're not under the law anymore. We no longer have the Jewish hierarchy. You don't have to be a Levite. You can aspire to do these things if you want to. And guess what? All of these things are for all of us. So that's the problem. We keep wanting to be real specific and say, okay, check off this box. Check one, check two, check three. But they're not setting up a new law. Paul is not setting up a new law for us to follow. He's just giving guidance, some, some wisdom about how you're gonna handle things. And to keep, oh sorry, go ahead. and to keep future problems at bay. Mm -hmm. Deacons, one of their main things was the widows and orphans to take care of them, which required you know money and all mm -hmm. that stuff. So you don't want a man in there that you didn't really test, who's going to be siphoning money off or taking advantage of widows or, you know what I mean. So when I asked, I said um, in my uh, when Dr. Tiffin and my college class was Pacific Christian College was teaching. I raised my hand and I said, I've noticed that the perspective of the scripture is male, but is there anything here that says that it should be a man? No. <laughs> he said, no. I said, well, some would say because he, it says the husband of one wife. He said, but that's because it's a patriarchal society and this was addressed to the men. Only the men would be considered for leadership in a patriarchal Jewish society. Sure. And that professor, by the way, was not in favor of women being preachers or elders or deacons. Mm. There was an interesting quiet in the classroom <laughs> <laughs> when, when that answer came because we all could see through it. We could all see through the reasoning. So it's kind of an interesting way we use the scripture sometimes to support what we want to be true. Go ahead, Dan. Well, that's all real good for the early church and everything, but we have the church today. They, we have this church here that we're a body, uh, part of the body. Now, in the Baptist uh, organization, we're bound together for missions. Missions, 
and and they have uh, each each group is autonomous. Each church is autonomous and doesn't have to go by the bylaws and local. You know, each church gets together and decides its own rule. Yes. So, who is our elders here? It would be the um, leadership committee. Is that correct? No. Mm -mm. We ran into problems. Um, well, how many years ago was it? Was it fifteen years ago? And um, in our church, there was some problems with who was an elder and who was doing what and what kind of spiritual leadership was being put on people who maybe were deacon type uh, leaders, not necessarily elder type leaders. And then the, that question, if I, I was on the outside of the discussions about that, I was just a part of the church and I wasn't a part of any leadership. But from, from my perspective, from where I was, those were the questions that were being asked. Mm -hmm. So when Charles uh, was um, invited to become our pastor at that time, uh, we did that study on the church um, and church organization. I forget the name of it. Um, but through that, I remember a lot of us talked about how do we want our church to be led. And I believe what occurred, you guys were here then, um, I believe what occurred is they determined that we had um, created a board um, eldership that was actually deacons and that we needed to um, change that. And so they created a leadership committee, um, but it's not called elders or anything. It's just a leadership committee and each position of the leadership committee represents different areas of the church, um, church work, church ministry so that we could report back from those areas of ministry and make recommendations to the body. That role of elder, um, I think, I don't know if, if that's the way people meant for it to be, but I think when I look at it, I see that as being pastoral in nature in our church. In other words, our pastor is the elder, and I believe there's one or two other people that he talks with that he considers of this level of maturity. And then there's a deacon board, and I believe the deacon board works together to take care of the different service areas that are needed in the church. Um, I've noticed that there's been some evolution in some of the responsibilities being taken on by the deacons, but I don't think there's been any official. The official organization of our church is that we don't really have anyone named as an elder, but we have a leadership committee which represents each person represents a major area of ministry and right. focus. They bring the input in, and, and then the deacons meet. And they're not, they're not, uh, they don't have an ordination ceremony no or No authority. Like, but the deacons do. I don't know what all is happening well, with the deacons. Well, when we, uh, Maybe we you elected that. deacons, and it was an election from the general public, and then they had an ordination service, and they ordained us as deacons and all that stuff. But all of a sudden, we're not servants anymore. They're bringing us all these problems. They're they're bringing us. The I mean, problems. back then, back yeah, then, yeah, yes. that, back then when I I didn't yeah. like that part. Yeah, I I was there to help and everything. I didn't think I was better than anybody or had any more authority. I just wanted to serve, and but all of a sudden, everybody's bringing us. Um, it was eldership type issues yes. that should have been yes. dealt with in that way, and so I, I, I know that was a part of that old com that conflict that occurred quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. But that's a good example of how Paul is advising this church. You know, he's advising Timothy to help him with those kind of church problems and saying, "Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do you have people who are serving as deacons dealing with these things that really are more elder material?" But in our current culture, we have paid pastors which that was, not, that was not in their organization. So. so what I'm saying is we're studying this like it's a big deal, and it was then, but it doesn't really apply so much to our church situation now. All these people in, in authority or any position of service should have these qualities and everything. <laughs> but we don't have the same structure as this church here. That's exactly right. 
So when we look for leadership in our church, we should be advised by this situation and say, you know, if we're going to have someone who's going to be making decisions about how we reach out for Christ, we need to make sure they have this elder type uh, criteria is involved. And if we're going to have a deacon board who's going to be managing the service in our church, we should make sure that, that these kinds of things are in place. Mm -hmm. And we, if we learn a lesson from the past, hopefully, I, I feel a little concerned that sometimes we get off again. But if we're not careful, we'll begin to have our deacon board talking and trying to function as, an, as elders. And we need to be careful about that because not all those people who are deacons are necessarily ready to be functioning in an area of elders. But when it happens, and it will happen again and again because we're all human, we need to go back to the Word of God and say, wait a minute, what, what, what are we doing here? Let's get ourselves, let's remember the lessons of the past and not repeat the mistakes. Well, the, the two brothers, uh, who was it? Uh, John and Andrew, they were brothers. I think that was the two. Anyway, they were saying, you know, can you put me... And, oh yeah, you know, yeah. Who's who's going to be the in top charge, dogs? Gonna be in and, charge. And, yeah. and Jesus told them, you know, whoever's going to be great in in heaven is going to be the servant of all, and and so he set the example, and and that's what we need to remember. Well, I would say personally, the thing that I really love about this passage is that it gives me a list of things to consider for aspiration in my own Christian walk. It tells me what a mature the attributes of a mature Christian. And I'm thinking that all of us could probably, out of that list, find things that we could work on. You know, we talk about, I, just, I struggle with eating or exercise. There's a thing here, self-control. I, I need to work on self-control. Everyone has their own thing. Maybe someone has trouble with being respectable. You know, whatever it is, we, have, we can aspire to, we can look at this as a list of things to aspire to in our Christian walk because it demonstrates mature Christianity. Not because it's uh, the law, you must have this, check, check, check. And if I were taking it that way, then only men have to do this. Women, you start at verse 11. In the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. There's the wife. Verse uh, 12, a deacon must be the husband of but one wife and must manage his children as household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. And then verse 14, this is the key. Verse 14, although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing to you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God the pillar and foundation of the faith, truth. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. So that, that's where Paul's focus is, and the elder, the deacon instruction, the orderly worship, all of that that came before is so that this message of the gospel will go forward. And if we as a church are doing what we should be doing, I would think that is one thing we could measure ourselves by. We could say, is what we're doing in terms of our deacons, our leadership committee, our pastoral staff, is what we're doing in that way, is it doing this? Is it reaching people for the gospel and not getting distracted by endless genealogies and all the other stuff that they got distracted by? I wrote down the... the, the um, the um, they were having trouble with hollow, hollow and deceptive philosophy, excessive legalism, obsessive mysticism, and excessive asceticism. So they were taking little pieces of Jewish culture or of Christian philosophy, and then they were going way overboard with it. And we saw that in the church of Colossae and of Laodicea. In chapter 4, that's what we're going to talk about, are these different distractions that they were experiencing. In Colossians, uh, we see uh, a more of a description. We read through some of those descriptions of the kinds of things they were getting distracted by. So is there anything wrong with having certain rules that you follow? No, but, but you got to recognize you could be excessive in it, right? 
Is there anything wrong with having discipline and disciplining your body and your mind? No, but you can go bananas with that. You can start whipping yourself on the back and fasting. How many times did God command the Jews to fast? Once. One time a year for one day. It was a black fast, no water, no food for 24 hours. Every year, one time a year. How many times do we read about fasting in the scripture? There are all kinds of fasts they did, right? So at what point are you overboard? If you... There comes a point, right? Yeah. We could all say you could take that far too far because you could die of fasting, you right? You go like three days but even, without eating Well, food. Christ went 40 days, right? Mm -hmm. So we even have models of Christ fasting. Fasting was one of the three pillars of Judaism. But the point is that all these things can be taken to excess. So who decides what's excessive? We need good, wise, mature Christians in every fellowship to help bring that around and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's look at what Christ, you know, what Christ has for us and what we should be doing with our faith. Let's get this back on the navigational beacon here, <laughs> right? Pull it back a little bit. So next time we will talk about uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Okay. Okay. I know I'm not going to be here next week. It'll be the follow. So next week we'll have everyone together in the patio room, and that's um, Mark is going to do something uh, a special lesson that.